Imagine ruling New York's high society from a gilded throne, only to face a tragic fall. Hi everyone, Ken here. Today we are exploring the many mansions of THE Mrs. Astor. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss a fascinating episode of This House. In 1830, Carolyn Skimmerhorn was born into an incredibly wealthy and prominent New York family. Her ancestors were some of the original Dutch settlers whom had arrived in Manhattan in the 1600s and had held on to hundreds of acres of land on the island of Manhattan. Her father was a shipping magnate worth the modern day equivalent of millions of dollars, and when he passed away in 1850, she inherited a large portion of his fortune, making her independently wealthy, something which was completely unheard of for an American lady at the time. Three years later, she married William Backhouse Astor Jr. And though the Astors could not lay claim to being original settlers in New York, they had been there for a long time and were now considered old money with massive holdings in real estate. As a wedding present, William Astor Sr. gifted the young couple a stately brownstone in the newly fashionable neighborhood developing at the corner of 5th Avenue and 34th Street. The refined residence was reserved in style, with plenty of space for the young couple to grow their family. Carolyn spent much of her time here raising her kids, with very little entertaining. But that would all change when William Sr. passed away and left the couple $45 million, the modern equivalent of $1.2 billion. Carolyn now viewed herself as the matriarch of the Astor family, and her husband as the patriarch, assuming the title of The Mrs. Astor. Heading the family came with the expectation of entertaining, and her cozy, family-oriented house needed a major overhaul to accommodate large parties. She chose to leave the exterior with quiet dignity, mostly untouched, but inside, the house transformed into a palace. The drawing room, shimmering in golden hues, was gilded from top to bottom and fashioned in the Rococo style. The dining room was updated to the Louis XV style and decorated with priceless French antiques. But perhaps the most well-known room in the house was the ballroom. The walls were covered in fine art with statues and heirloom rugs sprinkled about the floor. In total, the ballroom could comfortably play host to 400 guests, which eventually became the number of people which Mrs. Astor and her good friend, Ward McAllister, would deem suitable within high society, coining the term the 400. Of course, a family of such stature did not just entertain at their own home. They had purchased Ferncliff Farm in Rhinebeck, New York, the childhood home of Mrs. Astor's mother-in-law. Then, just as Newport, Rhode Island was becoming the place to summer, Mrs. Astor purchased Beechwood. The stately Italianate residence had been built in 1852, but in 1881, she hired famed Gilded Age architect Richard Morris Hunt to completely rework and expand the mansion. To best accommodate her social activities as the reigning queen of high society, the ballroom at Beechwood was designed to host 400 guests. The rest of the rooms were lavishly decorated with only the most fashionable furnishings of the time, and guests could enjoy riding horses, yard games, yachting, and taking a stroll along the cliff walk as waves broke on the shore below. When the eight weeks of the summer season had come to an end, Mrs. Astor would leave Beechwood for the year and return to her brownstone mansion, which was now just down the street from the newly completed Central Park. But not all was well at her home. Her brother-in-law had torn down his house next door to Mrs. Astor and built the Waldorf Hotel, which towered above the brownstone. As more developers tore down mansions and replaced them with skyscrapers, the area became too congested with crowds of people and the constant sounds and smells of buggy-to-buggy, horse-drawn carriage traffic. After living in the house for 40 years, she teamed up with her son, John Jacob Astor IV, to demolish the brownstone and build a hotel to compete with the Waldorf, which they named the Astoria. Meanwhile, they rehired architect Richard Morris Hunt to design for them the largest duo mansion ever built in New York City. Constructed in 1896 and designed in the Chateauesque style, the palatial duplex faced Central Park from the corner of Fifth Avenue and East 65th Street. On one side was Mrs. Astor's home, and on the other side, was her son, John Jacob Astor IV's home. Entering Mrs. Astor's side of the duplex, you would pass through the vestibule to arrive in the grand stair hall, 
where a sweeping marble staircase skirted the marble walls below a leaded skylight. Guests would be escorted to the reception room to comfortably await the announcement of their host. Then, if you were in her house for an informal event, you might mingle in the drawing room, finished out with floor-to-ceiling gilded wall panels and decorated with antique European furnishings. Perhaps if you were paying a visit for a more intimate affair, you would find yourself sitting at the dining room table, facing Mrs. Astor, who sat in front of the statue of Venus. But if you were there for a ball, you would find yourself in the largest room of them all, the ballroom. Rising four stories from the floor to the skylight, statuary took the place of corbels supporting the ceiling above walls which were covered in art. Out of sight, a minstrel gallery was concealed in the mezzanine, where live music would flow, completely hidden away from guests. She enjoyed entertaining from her mansion until she tragically slipped down the marble staircase, sustaining a significant head injury. From that point onward, she rarely hosted any guest and was said to have spent her remaining days mostly confused. In October of 1908, she permitted an interview with the delineator, in which she was quoted as saying, I am not vain enough to think New York will not be able to get along very well without me. Many women will rise up to take my place but I hope my influence will be felt in one thing, and that is in discountenancing the undignified methods employed by certain New York women to attract a following. Words spoken over 100 years ago, which are still relevant to this day. Unfortunately, she passed away later that month from the complications of her injury. The duo mansion passed to her son, John Jacob Astor IV, who made significant changes to the home, essentially joining both sides of the house. Its interior spaces became grander than ever, and the house was once again filled with guests for lavish parties and balls. Beechwood was also left to him, where he remarried in the ballroom. Unfortunately for John Jacob, he was aboard the Titanic when it sank. The Astoria merged with the Waldorf to become the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, and the two mansions were left to his estate. Over time, the Waldorf Astoria was torn down and replaced with the Empire State Building, and the Tuo Mansion was replaced by the Temple Emmanuel. Beechwood, however, passed down through the next generation before being sold out of the family. Today, it continues to stand, serving as a private residence. Ferncliff was also passed down through the family, but was eventually replaced by Vincent Astor's Astor Court. If you ever find yourself walking down the streets of New York, you won't find Mrs. Astor's mansions but you also won't be able to escape her legacy in shaping the city. If you enjoyed this video, check out this playlist where we take a deeper look into each of Mrs. Astor's mansions, with more photos and more in-depth history for each. Also, let me know which mansion was your favorite down below in the comments section. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.